What's going on everybody? It's your boy Big O back in the building with yet another brand new video. Just like to take a second to say thank you to everyone who's tuning in and I hope all of you are having a glorious day. Today I'd like to have a bit of a discussion about a little something we call taxonomy. What is it? Why is it important? Well, the simplest definition I guess would be the taxonomy is the classification of organisms. Uh, it's what's used to designate every living thing, be it animal, plant, fungus, bacteria, what have you, with a scientific name. If you take us humans, for example, we are known as Homo sapien. If you take my Pacific Coast giant Mexican musk turtle here, she is known as a Staurotypus salvinii. Two things you may immediately notice about the scientific names. One is that they are made out of two words most of the time. Sometimes there are three, but we'll get to that a little later. Uh, two words. The first word, in this particular case, is styrotypus, and that is the genus, meaning the uh, immediate family of organism, er, organisms that that particular organism belongs to. The second word, which is called the, it's called the specific epithet, and it tells us exactly what species the organism belongs to. Again, Taking this animal as an example, Styrotypus would be the genus, Salvinii would be the uh, species. Now, uh, as I said before, it's known as a Pacific Coast giant Mexican musk, but it's also known as a Chiapas giant Mexican musk after the state in Mexico where they are typically found in, and is also known as a giant Mexican musk or even just simply Mexican musk. Now, there is another turtle that is in the same genus that very much resembles this animal that is also referred to as a giant Mexican musk, which is the Styrotypus triprocatus. The problem with that is that triprocatus grow to twice the size uh, as adults, as Salvinia. Now, if you're, you know, if you prepared yourself to get a Salvini as a pet and you end up coming home with a Tripurcatus because you didn't really know the difference and you just grabbed the first thing that you saw that was labeled as a giant Mexican musk, you may run into some issues and it may potentially ruin your keeping experience. And that is exactly what we don't want. Um, so it's just something that you're you really need to pay attention to as a responsible reptile keeper. Uh, another really good example is African side neck turtles. Uh, it's something that you see all over the place. The big name uh, chain pet stores usually have them for sale. You see them very commonly at reptile shows and you see them very commonly uh, on your online vendors. The problem with the term African side neck, side neck turtle is that there's at least a dozen species that can fit that description. Um, and especially in the genus Pelusius, uh, a lot of those animals are very, very difficult to distinguish from species to species if, you know, if to the untrained eye, so to speak. Um, so uh, you, you can really start to see the problems that can arise if you're unfamiliar with the scientific names of the animals that you're interested in or you know the animals that you're keeping uh, especially for breeding purposes um, if we go over here to one of my other enclosures speaking of breeding purposes in this particular 40 gallon breeder there's the young female the smaller female I have a trio of striped neck musk turtles and you know, well there's the male striped neck musk turtles whoa there if we look under her dark little cave that's the bigger female there she goes she probably thinks it's feeding time so striped neck musks they are known as stenotherus minor pel peltifer if you notice there's three words in the name and that is because striped neck musk turtles are actually a subspecies of the loggerhead musk. When an animal is a subspecies, it has three words in the scientific name. The third word lets us know that it's a subspecies. Um, 
So, uh, a pro I was actually speaking to a really good friend of mine who also keeps turtles about this. He doesn't have any uh, striped neck musks, but he was asking me, there's a little bit of confusion because he was speaking to a, a local dealer in his, uh, uh, out where he lives. We, we, he li we live on completely different sides of the country. But um, apparently the dealer had a striped neck turtle that he was trying to sell. And my friend called me asking me what he, what do I think would, would, would be a, a fair price for a striped neck turtle. Um, you know, we had a bit, of, a bit of a conversation about it and, you know, we exchanged ideas. Lo and behold, lo and behold, the animal that uh, the dealer was trying to sell him was not a striped neck must turtle, but it was a striped neck turtle. Um, for those of us who may not know, there is an Asian species, uh, Maoremis sinensis, I believe is a scientific name, but it's known as a striped neck turtle. It's also known as a Chinese golden thread. Two common names that have absolutely nothing to do with each other, and one common name that is being sort of, you know, confused with a completely different turtle. We're talking about two completely different families of turtles. We're talking about two completely different continents. And side by side, these animals look nothing like each other other than the fact that they both have shells. So again, just, you know, more issues that can potentially arise, you know, when you're only using common names and you have no idea what the, uh, what the scientific names of these animals are. And okay, so with a bonus, we got a little breeding action here. I'm not sure if he's locked, but I have seen them do this very, very frequently in the last couple of weeks. Hopefully, should be dropping some eggs soon. But a whole nother story. So yeah, it's just something that you really need to watch out for, um, especially when you're dealing with animals that look very much alike. And, you know, in this particular case that I just spoke about, even with animals that don't look very much alike, um, common names can definitely be the cause of some very disappointing confusion. And actually, speaking of animals that look very much alike, if we look here, there he is. This is my male Escambia map turtle. Um... Scambia maps are not that well known in the pet trade. You don't see them that often. But um, maps in general, many of them do look very, very much alike. And it does require a bit of a trained eye to, sort of, to be able to tell them apart. And in situations like this, I think it becomes way more important to really learn your scientific names and, you know, even... Uh, you know, a bit about the distinguishing features and like the, the anatomy of the animals that you're looking for because it really does help. It really will save you some hassle and it'll definitely save you some disappointment. One of the very reasons why I picked this guy up in the first place was because uh, when I did find him, for sale, it was the first and only time I've ever seen an Escambia map turtle for sale. And since then, I've only seen them for sale two more times. Very beautiful animal. But, um, you know, if you if you take a look at, say, a Pearl, R Pearl River map, and you put this guy right next to it, it's gonna be pretty difficult if, again, if, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have that trained eye. It's going to be pretty difficult to be able to tell them apart. Uh, if, you, if, if you're not exactly aware, the best way to tell map turtles apart is the, uh, the yellow markings around the eye and like on the top of their heads. And a lot of times the, the markings on the plastron can help as well. 
But if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know what you're doing, and you know, you're you're trying to find a specific species of map turtle. Things can get a little dicey. You really need to watch out for very specific little details. Because sometimes, you know, you know, we're, we're all human and we make mistakes. Uh, things might just get mislabeled. I see that, you know, the larger pet stores all the time, they mislabel their, their turtles constantly. It's super frustrating. But, you know, they just don't know any better. Sometimes they probably just don't care either, but that's a whole other story. So yeah, I guess the point of this video really is to sort of educate yourself and be aware of what's going on. <clears throat> be aware of the animals that you keep, the animals that you're interested in keeping. Uh, be aware of the people or the places that you get your animals from. And overall, just pay attention to what's going on because one slip up and you can be, you know, it, things can just get super frustrating and just, like I said before, it can potentially ruin your keeping experience and, you know, who wants that? But at the risk of making this video a bit too long, like I said before, Pay attention to what you're doing. Research, research, research. And familiarize yourself as best you can with these lovely animals because it just makes your keeping experience that much better. Questions, comments, concerns, you already know, leave them down in the comment section. Definitely hit that thumbs up, definitely hit that subscribe. And until the next time, Happy Reptile people. Peace.